Greg With is he yes, in? John Sova. Yep, got them both in. Yeah, those are. John is the was the four A rules captain, and Greg yeah, and Greg was up at three A. Brad Wisely's on. He was at five A. Looks like Andy Morning, Parks Tom. is on. Or is in. Hey, Brad. Morning, Tom. How are you? Good. Andy, you uh, quarantining there in a RV? I'm in my camper. <laughs> yep. <laughs> hey, Andy. <laughs> Hi, Tom. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm out for t two weeks. Oh, wow. Crazy. I'm healthy. I'm fine. No issues. But uh, my office shares an air handler with someone who is positive, and that was enough to put me out. <clears throat> <laughs> if anybody yeah, comes up with a worse way to get out than that, Andy, I, I want to hear it and see it. <laughs> <laughs> it hasn't been all bad, actually. So when we start around right around 10, I'm going to go get Rhonda. All okay. right. She's in she's in a meeting and that to give us enough time to get people on, I think. And then then, then she can just say a few words and then go back to her meeting. Okay. All right. Good morning, everyone. Hey, Doyle. How are you? I'm doing good, how are you? Good. You got any events going on in other states? Yeah, we got the districts in Florida and the sectionals in Illinois. And New Mexico is just getting going. They're gonna they're gonna run late. Well, Arizona is still going, so the the southern states are still are still doing it. When you say still going, are they the regular season? Yeah, okay. Arizona's the the state championships in Arizona and Florida are at the end of the month. Okay. Illinois will finish up. Michigan's are this weekend. So they're they're just finishing up in the northern states. That is a bold move for Illinois and Michigan to wait till middle of October to finish golf. Yeah, I know. It's I think they've had they've had <laughs> right about that, yeah. That's 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 dicey. Being from Minnesota, October 15th is not a good date to be hosting state championships. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Minnesota's in the spring. They usually do their states in June, which works out pretty nice for them. Morning, Ashley. Morning, John. Morning. Hi, Ashley. Good morning. Tom's good. I'm going to get Rhonda um, just to pop in quick and say a brief introduction, then we'll get rolling.
Monica, are you taking notes for this or should I take notes for this? Um, I'm going to take some notes, but you should take some too, and then we'll just collaborate with them. All right. Sounds good. Okay. I won't do them directly on that document that I shared with everybody. We'll create a secondary one. Yeah, I'll do my own here too. And then um, we, I can go back in and type up what I have, and then I'll share that with you and you can add what you have. Perfect. Okay. Are you on? Yeah, you're, you're good. Am I unmuted? You're good, Rhonda. Hi, guys and girls. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least I get to come to this meeting. He just pulled me out of the audit meeting. So after no basketball and spring sports, that's not a fun meeting I'm in right now. So, hey, I just want to thank you guys. Um, I've said this so many times on our league, but in a, and sorry, you'll have to see this in the commissioner's update. But with everything that's been going on, when we have the opportunity to attend a state culminating event in these times. And um, it, it really does underscore our why. I know that we're all have a lot on our plates and, and, and we're being asked to react and make things happen in the snap of a finger. But I, I, I just, first of all, I wanna thank the golf committee um, for everything that they're doing. I think moving the, I had an opportunity to speak with many of the CGA and, and members that were assisting with the tournaments. And, and they keep, they continuously say that Chassa Golf Committee, Chassa, you know, under Tom's leadership is that we are providing high level um, opportunities for our kids with electronic scoring um, and just moving the sport forward, right? Like we're one of the states that have some of the top golfers that want to play high school. Um, that doesn't happen everywhere. Um, and so it is about what you guys have put together, guys and girls have put together. It's what you bring forward. You don't try to make grand changes in it, but our kids want to be a part of the high school experience. And I think that starts with the committee. So I just want to thank you for that. And then Tom knows I went to Gunnison for 3A. And I have to tell you, um, probably needed that more than I knew. Um, but just to be in that atmosphere, having parents thank us for resuming athletics and activities. Um, and it was just, um, it was, I, I, I sounds a little weird, but it was a really a, a soul satisfying opportunity to be with those kids, with the parents, with the officials um, for an event that our communities needed more than we knew. Um, and so I appreciate all of those that help again, uh, resume golf across the state of Colorado because our kids and communities needed it. They need sports right now. Um, and so I just appreciate that leadership as well. I always say this because I try not to have a canned speech, but we always have to say this, right? And it is like you are making decisions for the state as a committee. You are making decisions um, for Gunnison. You're making decisions for um, Cherry Creek. You're making decisions for St. Vrain. And, and we just always ask that um, when you're bringing something forward for our legislative council to consider that it has that big picture kind of thought process of how it impacts our rural areas as well as the more metro areas, um, whether that's looking at dates, whether that's looking at implementation strategies. Um, we just ask you to look at it in a bigger picture of, of how that makes it uh, happen for, for all of our schools that participate with golf. So um, I know that you do that and I know that you've done that. That's just kind of our disclaimer, right? That you're here to represent the whole state. So um, I just wanted to put that out there, but any questions for me? Um, I think that every time I go to a state event, I, I revert back to spring when we didn't have any opportunities. And so just the, the most um, basic ways to provide this uh, is, is really a, a time for celebration for our state association. Thanks, Rhonda. Any, nobody has questions? 
All I can tell you is I'm glad the golf courses had their concession stands open because that did not happen at softball last week. So <laughs> best food ever is the golf course food. So, hey, well, good luck to you all. Have a great day today, and I'll go see what I can do with the auditors. So good luck. All right. <laughs> thanks. See you later. <laughs> all right. Switch chairs. <laughs> All good. <laughs> I see Jessica's on and John and looks like a, I think we've got everybody. I was waiting for Dave, which like I said, we're going to get started without him. So. You want me to get rolling time? How do you want to do it? Uh, whenever, whatever you, you think, I think. David knows he's, uh, we're supposed to start at 10. He's hopping on right now. Oh, he's on, he's in. He must be listening or I don't see a, a, a video for him, but he's he's in the meeting. So perfect. we're good. Awesome, well, I'll get us started. Hey, I am Chad Eisentrager. I'm the athletic director at Mead High School. I am also the chair of the golf committee um, effective this year um, and it's, uh, being a soccer guy, when I took over the golf job at Frederick High School eight years ago, I didn't know what I was getting myself into, and it quickly became my favorite high school sport um, of all time. So I've moved on from soccer in this realm, and the great part is I got to know a lot of you through this process and get to know Tom. So uh, it's a pleasure. Um, and then I'll introduce kind of the other people that are on the chair as well, or on the, the board as well. Um, so we got Andy Parks uh, representing Rampart High School, um, Justin Nofsinger representing Frontier Academy, uh, David Hun just hopped on. He's representing um, Berthet in the Long Peaks League. And then Derek Cordes is not here. Uh, he's the athletic director at Castleview as well. And then other people that will be kind of talking today and are important to our success as a golf committee. Um, we've got uh, Doyle, who's our I Want to Make Her Genius. And then we've got Ashley Barnhart, who is our JCAC um, representative as well. So um, I know we met a lot last year and we came up with a lot of good changes last year that are at a legislative council. We approved and moved forward with those things. So that's, uh, that's the group that represents. And then obviously we've got other people tuning in, whether it's people that helped host state events this year, rules officials, stuff like that. And do we want to go through and introduce those people, Tom, or what do you think? Uh, you can when they, they're ready to, to speak. That's fine. Awesome. Uh, Greg, you want to introduce yourself? You're muted, Greg. Greg with. I'm you, Greg, Greg with. Uh, I'm the chairman of the Rules of Golf Committee with the Colorado Golf Association, um, and I work the uh, tournament in Gunnison. John. John Silva. I'm on the uh, golf committee with the Colorado Golf Association, and uh, I worked. Uh, uh, 4 a in uh, Colorado Springs. Perfect. Brad? Good morning. I'm Brad Weasley. I'm also on the Rules of Golf Committee, and I was at the 5A at Rolling Hills. I like your background, Brad. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Favorite place to be. Kathy? Hi, I'm Kathy Malpass. I'm a golf coach at Evergreen High School. Welcome. And then obviously Monica's on here too. She is Tom's assistant. Um, and probably in reality, Tom is Monica's assistant if it works anything like our jobs do in the athletic director <laughs> world. So it does. Um, <laughs> awesome. Before we get going, obviously. <laughs> and so. Uh, before we get going, obviously, I want to congratulate uh, Colorado Academy, Cheyenne Mountain Valor um, for their team wins, and then Nick Pevney, Jordan Jennings, and then Lucas uh, Schulte for their individual championships in this last season. Um, and a big thanks to those that were rules officials out there and then the ADs that helped host and run those events. Um, we couldn't have done it without those guys and, and those teams and kids, I'm sure, are very appreciative of the work we put in. Um, so we've had our introduction from Rhonda. Uh, the first thing we need to do is make sure we adopt the minutes from our last um, golf committee meeting. So anybody out there make a recommendation to adopt the minutes? We got Andy with a recommendation. Uh, anybody I can second? second. 
I'll second. And Jess with the second. Awesome. All in favor of passing the minutes from 2019? Nailed it. Proud of you guys. I don't know if you saw that, Tom, but my first meeting, 100% approval. 100%. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to end the meeting right now and just call it good because that's where we are. Okay. So, awesome. Um, Doyle, you want to give us an update on I Want to Make Her and kind of where we stand? I can. Let me share my screen here so we can get this. I'm going to move into presentation mode and share this. Okay, well, thank you guys. And uh, everyone can see my screen? Yep. All right, super. Well, first, I want to say uh, thank you to the committee and to um, all the coaches across the state of Colorado for doing a tremendous job this year, given these difficult times to be able to, to pull it off. It was, it was, uh, it was pretty amazing. Um, and every year I continue to learn more and, and that with that feedback, continue to make the product better. Uh, I would not be able to do that without the feedback and without a strong relationship with the Colorado Golf Association. So thank you to all the members of the CGA as well. So let's just quickly go through, I got a lot of things to cover here, but I want to spend more time on, on the latter stuff versus the beginning. The, 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 this is the participation. I show this every year. Uh, you can see that the girls is down and we all know why, but take a note of the boys. It's pretty amazing in the increase in number of players uh, in the system. More importantly, the number of golfers that are registered and are now you know, taking more uh, of a responsibility in the scoring on the app. It's just been overwhelmingly uh, positive and, and, and it's been, and been really good to be able to enhance the system because of that. Um, and that meaning that uh, a golfer being able to sign their scorecard digitally would not happen if we didn't have a sign in, right? So you got to have registered golfers to be able to do that and do that the right way. This is the number of ranked golfers. Obviously, we got more golfers, so we got more ranked golfers. Girls are down because uh, the season was cut short. The number of ticket sales was unbelievable this year. And if, if the girls would have happened, I think we would have exceeded $40,000 in ticket sales. One thing to keep in mind, in 2013, there were no ticket sales. There was no money going back to high schools throughout the state of Colorado. And, and it is, it, this is something that, that continues to grow. We are amazed at, at that, you, that 19 was a little bit off, but, but the growth, and if we would have had a girl season, we would have continued on that same trajectory of, of a uh, 35, 34, 35% growth. So it's been, it's been very, very good. And, and what does that mean? That means that more fans are willing to buy more, buy the tickets, to have a grand experience, to be able to experience golf like they experience other sports. And, and how does that happen? Well, that happens with me doing my job and, and making sure that they have a good experience from a technology perspective, but just as important for Chassa and the committee to put forth uh, rules and, 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 um, and, and expectations of how the app will be used. And then by the coaches to create the events and then for the golfers to be able to score the events, that those all have to happen. So, so we are one big team here, and then even for the CGA, for the you know for the state championships to make sure that the rules of golf are 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 enforced during competition. So that it all we all have to work together. So this year, the schools will receive approximately twenty-two thousand four hundred dollars. Those will be sent out in December, and that is um, of all the regular season and uh, regional ticket sales. What we spend each year, not a lot of you know this, but this is the amount of money that we invest, uh, invested in 2020 on app improvements, website improvements, uh, that, that, that is all based on requests that we receive from others. And you might think, well, gosh, Joel, you're crazy. How can you spend more than you make? Well, it's because, because Colorado and Arizona of what they did and taking this on in 2013 have allowed us to expand to Michigan, New York, North Dakota, New Mexico, Florida, 
Illinois and Michigan uh, and Minnesota. Um, it was tremendous to see what happened in Illinois this year for, to see them leap from never using it before at all to their sectional tournaments this week. In fact, there's four tournaments going on right now. Um, by the way, Illinois is the third largest in the United States as far as states go, as far as high school golfers. So it has been a very, very busy season for us. Um, but right now they're running out of their 20 sectional tournaments. 11 of them are doing scorecard exchange, which means they're secure scoring. They're, they're doing it for, with golfers only on the IHSA golf app and they're signing their scorecard. They're doing everything with a, what, with, with a marker. And this is the first year they saw it. I, I'm just, I'm still in awe as to as, that they accomplished all that. But it just goes to say how, uh, goes to say how much people have accepted this, 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 this method, this uh, how to how to score digitally, and and take it all the way through to the end where you actually sign your scorecard when you're complete. Some of you hadn't seen this before, but we developed this last summer in junction with the CGA. Ed, Tom, Ed Mate is so adamant about pace of play. And so I said, well, I can do this. But I asked one thing. I said, you have to guarantee me that, that golfers will be consistent and score after every hole. Consistent, right? You, you, you can't you know, not score one hole because how can I get a timestamp if scores aren't entered you know, for a hole? And they say, oh, let's just put them in next hole. That, that's, that's not going to produce good results, good data. So on the pairings, if you go to the app and on the pairings, uh, when you tap on pairings, we've got a badge here. And what that badge means is that that pairing was out of position that number of times. And, and they really, they probably weren't, but we're only as good as the data. So what happened in, in this case here, let's take a look at this bigger staff, Hart and Lowry. Tremendous, right? So they just got a late start. But look at the timestamps on all these holes. That's exactly how much time it took them, how much they were behind the group in front of them because they were not a lead group, okay? So the lead group is measured against time par, which is we gave a very uh, generous 14 minutes. It was, that was specified by the, the CGA. If you look at this one on the right here, you can see how wacky it got on the back nine. And that's because of inconsistencies in, in people entering scores. Now it can be off if the group in front of them weren't consistent because what we do, it's, it's fairly simple. It's like when, when, the group, when a group finishes a hole and they record their scores, we stamp that, okay? The group behind them, when they finish that same hole, we stamp that and we just do the math. We just say, what's the difference in time between this group and that group? And we post it. And, and, and the reason you see those odd numbers is because it was just not, something wasn't quite done right. And what that was, was consistency. Consistency of scoring after every hole at the same time. And so one of the things that I think should be thought about here is, is to teach these young athletes that it's important to be consistent, that when you arrive at the next tee, record your scores. Record your scores after every hole, communicate, record, confirm, and then tee off. And so if, if, if I could make one recommendation, I think that that, that should be something that, that is taught to these, to these uh, student athletes. So that kind of goes along with the next thing I wanna talk about, and, and Tom and I have talked about these things through the year, but I need to put things into the system, and that's why I'm showing this, is that establishing standards is very important, okay? So the, everyone knows about the IWR calculation. And, and so what does that mean? And, and so before I go on to the rest of it, which is all these are related, I'm gonna bring over here a, an, a, a browser where I'm showing the, and, and by the way, I just added this feature right here. And I can call this whatever you wanna call it. This is what Arizona calls it because they have what's called qualifying rounds. Meaning that when they, they specify seven, they do nine hole rounds. So you say seven rounds is the minimum. If you don't get seven rounds, seven nine hole rounds in, qualifying rounds in, um, then you're not gonna qualify for state tournament. And then there's a maximum too, because you don't want teams playing so much. And that's just what Arizona does. This is, this is Colorado does things different. So 
So here you have the, the option to, to pick between all rounds and qualifying rounds. Well, what does qualifying rounds do? Well, let me look at, at John. John's in the call. So I'm going to take a look at, at Cheyenne Mountain. And when you choose qualifying rounds, I just happened, I just set the number at six. Okay. You can see the ones in green, and the ones in green are the ones that are used to calculate the IWR for Cheyenne Mountain. Uh, if you look at all rounds, if I go back over here and I flip to all rounds and I click change, Cheyenne Mountain's not at the top anymore, but if I click on this, that means that we're looking at every single round to calculate the IWR. So it's important to know that because this is what Tom and I have talked about and in, in, uh, in sharing with him that, that the system has the ability, right? I just need to know what to set it at. And that's not my decision. That is the, a committee decision. But I wanted to show this to you because it's going to be a topic of discussion. The second one is, is how many scores are you counting out of how many players? Well, again, it's a standard, right? And so because you do four count three in your state championships, that's what I do in the rankings. As well as most of you know, that's not what's followed across the state. In most other states, when they say we're doing six count four, they do six count four everywhere across the whole state for regular season as well as postseason. So this is just something that that again, not my decision. That's this is your decision, but just to give you an idea. So I talked about the IWR calculation and the qualifying rounds, um, scores to count. So you know the rankings are using four three Arizona five four, Minnesota Illinois Michigan North Dakota they do six players and they count the best four. New York does eight, six, and then there's Colorado with four, three. So just some, just some, some uh, information for you to, to have as you think about what to do here. And you tell me, well, we're going to do this, and I will, I will do that. Right now, it's set to four, count three. Um, the last thing I want to talk about here is the double par pickup. And I'm going to, over here on the screen, I'm, I'm showing you what we're going to invest some money in this year to make it better and easier for golfers when they get down with a hole if they did pick up what to do, they're going to be able to just touch a button. And, and again, that's a decision that you should make as a state, right? To say, what should that be? What should that default be? Um, coaches can make the change at the event level. They will be able to, but right now, what would that standard be? Is it double par? Is it, I heard circle 10 in Illinois. I've heard, I've heard double par plus one. I've, I've heard lots of different things. So uh, what would be helpful to me is for you guys to decide that, Hey, uh, if we do have a standard here, maybe you say, I ah, don't care about that. And that's fine. Right. I'm just saying it's an option. And, and so what I would need is, is what is it and what will, what we put in. The other thing that will happen is, is that most importantly is that if a person picks up, typically you wait until the end of the round to mark them as DNS. Cause they come in the yeah, idea that I picked up on number six and now all of a sudden the team scores off. That's not good. And because we are in a digital era, that doesn't have to happen. The system will automatically mark that player as DNS if they touch picked up. It's going to put a score in, but it's going to eliminate that player from the team score. It's also going to put them down on the bottom of the leaderboard. Uh, they're still going to be there, right? It'll just be marked for the position as DNS, okay? So that will happen. Uh, so if I could get some, some feedback on this information, that'd be today, but eventually as, we, as I start to prepare for next year, I can put those changes in. The last thing I want to talk about is this is an email that this is information or or uh, an email I get from someone who says, hey, I don't I really don't want my kids to see the score. And I have to go through this explanation of saying that they really should keep track of their score because to do golf right and to follow the rules, you should know your score and you should know what your marker is doing for you. When a marker puts a score in, then you should say thank you. Right. We're going to add a feature that will actually allow them to say, I accept this score and it's going to be locked. Right. And the only person who can change that will be a, a, a manager or a rules official. But but to teach these student athletes, going back to what I said before, is that record your scores after every hole. Make sure that you and your marker are communicating and that when your marker puts a score in, you can't just you can't just ignore that score and and wait till the end. And then you have this, this, this uh, time where you're comparing scores after the fact. 
because as you know, if you study and have heard about golf and, and shaving of strokes, time is the biggest factor that's used. Yeah, I did that four year, four hours ago. They're not gonna remember that I put this down and they put that down. I'm gonna be able to argue for what I want it to be. That doesn't have to happen. They decide on the whole, this is what I got and it's recorded. It's set in stone. It's, it's, it can't be changed unless someone else gets involved. So, so this is something that, that I come across a lot. Coaches get it, they understand it, but now we just have to figure out a way in this digital era to teach the student athletes how to do it and how to do it right and follow the rules. Okay, that's all I've got. So questions. Hey Doyle, um, this is Tom. In, in terms of the pace of play, do you have like a, a database of information for uh, each of the state events that you put together? How do you, how do you show how, uh, how it went in terms of pace of play? The only thing we have right now is on the app. We are, and I, I'm gonna do this in junction with, and I talked, I had a text conversation with, with Ashley, is I wanna design that, what that looks like in junction with the CGA. Um, all the work that we've been doing on this has been, you know, with guidance from Ed Mate and, uh, and, and, and Ashley and, and her team. And so, so what that looks like, it, it's coming. And so then you'll have the ability. And most likely, just to give you an idea, it's going to probably be, um, if I go to events, it's going to be similar to, and if I just go to pass, and I'll just pick the three A's, since we're, we were talking about that earlier. And you go to scoreboards, and I'll make this wider so you can see more here. Here is where you see the traditional large up on a big screen, right? And if you go hole by hole um, and you click go, and you can do this for teams, let's just do, let's do individual. That'll, it'll make more sense there. So if you do it like this, and obviously I'm gonna have to do this, and this is where it's gonna take a little bit of thought is probably by pairing, right? So if we have a pairing here, and instead of a number here, we'll have a time. And then we can also then uh, layer right into and, and do a more of a progression type thing, right? Where you can actually see as time goes on how, how, they're, how they were playing, how fast they were playing. So all that will be developed. It'll be available in a format like this, but in, in, you'll be able to have individuals as well, right? Because there's an individual every time a, tank, uh, a score is entered, that time is stamped. But you'll also have your parents, right? Because it's really the parents' responsibility to keep up. Right. And then it, it'll be the official's job just to get in and say, you know, uh, you guys are behind. And uh, then then it comes down to, well, it's that guy over there. He's he's you know, he's he's playing slow. Right. But that that's all I can do is give the numbers. So it'll be in a format, something like this time. OK. Yeah. Thanks. Joe, can I ask you a quick question? I think you started to hit on this, but I know for our league, we had a lot of trouble with the actual player not keeping their own score, which you talk about this on your sheet. Um, however, I know there's a lot of apps out there that the player can put their own score in. And at the end, when they're verifying scores or whatever, you can see the discretion in the two scores. So say somebody's put, you had a five, but you put a four on yours. And you can see that in some of the apps. Is that something you're thinking about working on for your app? Um, for the part of integrity, we noticed a lot of that in our league this year of the kids not even keeping their own score anymore, which to me, that is a huge issue with golf and the integrity. Is that something you guys are looking at in your app? Well, but to answer that, and it kind of goes back to that, the screen that I showed you before is, is this, and this is where Ed May is very adamant about this, is that you must score hole by hole. The, the whole idea of, of, of not reconciling until after the round is over is not the way the rules of golf are written. You're supposed to sign your scorecard at the end, but you're supposed to certify and verify your scores after every hole and not wait till the end. That's why the, the, the and, and believe it, it's just the way it, they didn't have technology back when they, when they first started playing stroke play competition. And so the only way to really do it was, hey, you know, to go over and say, show me what you wrote down. Show me what you wrote down after every hole, 18 times. They're not going to do that. So they said, well, let's just, let's just do that at the end. And, and that's not always good because you forget. Well, you forgot what happened four hours ago. So to teach them how you should reconcile after every hole is really the way the rules are written. 
And right, I, co- I, I completely, I completely understand that. I just, I just feel like there should be two way checks and balances. So you were talking about the kids could confirm it. So can you, com- can you say how that side on their app could work? Yes. So I'm, okay, so that, does yeah, that make good, sense? That's a good question. So let me do this. I have, get rid of this now. I'm trying to get rid of this screen here. Oh, there we go. Okay, down here. So why he's doing that, uh, Jessica, I just uh-huh. want to make sure I understand your question. You're talking about making sure that uh, when a marker puts something down, the player that's being marked for um, has information then and there so they can confirm it? Yeah, so I'm trying to see how there's a two-way checks and balances. So like, so on some of the apps, that are out there and um, you can put, you would put in the score you're marking plus your own score. And if those don't match with the person who's marking your score, it's a red flag, correct? So then you're talking about it right there. And I think Doyle hit on that a little bit that they were trying to put that in and maybe I missed that. So, but I think that's an important part of it that you're, you're then making the kid check their app as well to to just to verify their own score physically instead of just saying, yeah, I, I got a four and then hoping that that's what the person put in. They, they have to actually physically hit something to verify that on their side. So, I mean, it's like another second, if that makes sense. Yes, that's correct. And, and that's a good point. So, so the idea is, is to be able to somehow confirm. So this is my design here of what the score screen will look like going forward. Okay. And so what this what this is showing here is is the the um, the score screen. So you can see this badge here. So Darcy, I can't, I can't see it. Can anybody? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. I got I got to share it again. Sorry, guys. Sorry about that. Okay. So let me go to this one here. And now you're looking at at the design of of the app. Okay. So in this situation. Uh, you can see that that scores are being entered. Darcy is the scorer for Danielle. Okay, so then someone else is scoring for Darcy. So you can see this badge right here, and that's the confirmation piece. So that means that you've got a score to confirm. So you touch on that and you confirm it. So ideally, after every hole, as soon as it's entered, you'll see it pop up and say, uh, "Darcy just entered a, a five for you. Do you confirm that? Yes. Boom. Locked. Done. That is." in replacement for writing it down because why write it down and try to compare and then compare at the end when you can confirm it right away and it's locked and it never can be changed again unless you bring a rules official into the mix, into the conversation. So so that is the design that I have come up with in conversations with Edme. Does that make sense? That makes sense, thank you. That was just my concern was the kids aren't confirming their own score um, and then they're not keeping score. We've noticed that a lot in our league this year. So that yeah. And so if they ignore it, they're going to have a badge here that says 18 on it. You didn't confirm eight, any of your scores. So, so you know, technology is not always as easy as people think. But, but there's a lot of things that happen. There's a lot of things to think about when you're designing these things that that can do infinite number of things, right? And so what we come up with now, and, and this will have to be, we'll test this in in the off months. But, but just using the badging technology, which people get, right? It's like, hey, you, if you don't confirm it right away, you're gonna have this badge. The badge is gonna stay there until you confirm it. And so once you touch on that, then you're gonna be able to confirm that that's what my marker put and I confirm that score is right. It'll be locked. And again, can only be changed by a, a rules official or a manager of the event. Perfect, thank you, Joe. You're welcome. So I think we're good, Chad. Um, we, we're going to get to uh, talking about uh, some of the things that uh, some decisions we're going to make, but uh, we'll, we'll just move on with your agenda. That's fine. Sounds good. Do we want John to go? So and if he doesn't want to stay on, he can kind of talk about hosting his the regional and our sure, state Sure, just tournament. to get some feedback. Yeah. Yeah. John, you'd, would you like to kind of talk about what you saw hosting the state tournament in the age of COVID and all that stuff? Actually, I think with the 4A, I think everything went pretty smoothly. Uh, 
uh, I didn't really see any hiccups. Uh, the, the biggest problem we had is, uh, um, and I think Greg uh, encountered the same thing, is some of our uh, calls for rules officials were coming over, I want to make her email. And uh, we had given them phone numbers, and phone numbers was easy. Uh, we just answer the phone, and, and if I can answer them, I answer them. But I was not regularly checking my email, and the first day, at the end of the day is when I found out, oh, there are four or five emails. And uh, I, I would think that uh, they subsequently made a phone call, but uh, that was just a little bit of a hiccup is that uh, we were really not checking emails for uh, calls for rules. Uh, I'd and like to speak to that. So, so going forward, we're gonna have text messaging next year. So um, you can choose either a text message, an email, or a phone call too. I, I haven't really thought about whether that should be an option, but you guys will have to give me feedback as to how you want them to communicate with you. Would that yeah, I, think, I think as long as we have a heads up, we'll uh, uh, know that it's there and we'll know to look. Uh, but uh, this time we really didn't. Yeah. And uh, I didn't even expect them to be coming that way. And I think maybe for state tournaments too, because the turnaround is so quick and the, the impact regionals and state, maybe we eliminate the email portion. So it would just be phone call or text message. So it's immediate. And then we can get the rules officials out to those holes. Um, I think for league play, we can, we can allow the, the tournament to continue, but those ones, those rulings, I think we want to get right as quickly as possible. You know, on our zoom call, which was the first time we did it for, uh, for state, uh, personally, it, it, I thought it was pretty effective because we had everyone on the call. And, and, I, and I remember that we gave out phone numbers and that, that was kind of the standard. So somehow that, that dis, did, there was a disconnect from that meeting to the players, I think. Probably. I think one of the other things that you could run into with, uh, you know, I mean, I, uh, I worked a golf tournament at Perry Park where there was only about uh, three cell phone or one cell phone company that worked at a golf course like that. So, and I don't know if we're going to encounter that at some of the other places in Western Slope or some of the more isolated locations that uh, all of a sudden your phones don't work. And, uh, and then also, I guess the email or the text is not going to work either. So it's just one of the places that could be a glitch. Yeah, those possibilities exist, you know? Those devices will go down some sometime. John C., would you like to kind of talk about what you saw running the event as well? Well, I, yeah, I appreciate that, Chad. Um, John Caracato, Shine Mountain. Um, I really thought that uh, as far as the overall um, setup of the golf course and how how uh, teams got to the golf course and separate. I thought it was, I thought it was a, uh, it was a well run. Um, the one thing I would, um, maybe we can have a conversation about, or this committee could have a conversation about is, is the um, second day going as individuals instead of doing the waterfall feature. Um, and why I bring that up is then if we go individual, we have a more of a separation of players and then the range, you know, the 45 minute rule getting onto the golf course, especially if you're an out of town team, that that's kind of hard to manage, I suspect. Um, and so maybe that, that conversation and, and seeing if we do, uh, both days, um, during the uh, waterfall. Now that's not going to fix everything because we have individuals playing, but for those 10 to 12 teams, um, if we do those two days, I think maybe that'll help with, um, with players getting on, on property, either, uh, you know, within the 45 minute time frame. How big was I would, the gap? I would agree with that. How big was the gap between first tee time and last tee time? Do you remember? An hour and 30 minutes at, uh, at the foray. And I'm, I'm guessing, but I think that's what it was. Yeah. Hour and hey, John, when you say waterfall, what do you mean? Um, one, two, three, four. Maybe that's not that. Maybe I'm not using the correct words, but similar to what we do on the first day, Tom. So, um, okay. Teams together. Yeah. yeah, the wave method. 
yeah. the way. Thank you. Um, but other than that, I you know I thought that uh, you know at at uh, Country Club of Colorado there was um, cart. I don't know if we had enough carts, but I, I mean that's those are operational things that, um, um, and it's more about the spectator carts than anything. But uh, uh, I don't know if that's a committee thing more than it is a golf course operational. What we try, what we try to do with spectators is only only give them out if they go to uh, a handicapped individual, but uh, there's there's limitations there as well, just because we we do give a cart to every team. And so after a while it's it's inventory. And then I know, you know, spectators uh, get upset about that, but at some point or another, there's gonna be some issues with that. It, right. we, and it happened at all three events. Yeah. And so the only thing, other thing that I had at 4A and it had nothing to do with the way the tournament was run, I thought that went fine. But uh, when I set up the course, uh, I asked the, uh, the superintendent, he said, uh, how do you want the greens running? And I said, somewhere between 10, 10 and a half would be good for this kind of a tournament in case we have wins. And I think they were running a little bit faster than that. And now they're, that's one of the things I heard about a lot is, uh, boy, those greens were just really fast. And, you know, All right, John. You know that, that's it. I said that, that was a, the one thing they were very, very cooperative about everything, but that was the only glitch that I saw. That golf course, those greens on that golf course are, are you know, have a lot of slope. And so when you start talking about the stem, um, I don't know. Part of it too was on the, especially on that first day, the wind picked up and it kind of started baking the, the greens, um, made them quicker, but it, that golf course, I think, is always going to be difficult uh, because of the slope of those greens. And I know Rolling Hills has a lot of a lot of that as well. And um, uh, but I, we heard that at uh, four at the state championship on the girls' side a few years ago as well. And I'm not I'm not so sure how you you fix that. I mean, I got a great relationship with Glenn, um, and maybe we can have that conversation with him. But uh, um, both both times and recently when that that venue was hosted, uh, the greens were the the talk of the conversation. Yeah, I got an email that said that they were uh, illegal, and that they were <laughs> and that they were going to immediately go to the USGA and and uh, tell them that Chassa's events are not run correctly. So it was just one email, but. Uh, <laughs> I think you all got the message as well. So that's just something to, to, to remember in the future, I think, right? It just make, in some ways it makes it more difficult for us when we're setting up a course, because if we uh, select whole locations and then uh, the whole locations we, like I ended up changing two of mine that were already pre-picked because of the speed of the greens. I said, uh, uh, these whole locations will not do with the speed of the green. So I have to change whole locations based on that. So if somebody turns around and makes them 13, I'll probably have to change five or six that I've already selected for whole locations as it des definitely changes what's viable as a whole location. So that's why I kind of like to have some consistency there. Appreciate what you did, John. Well, you pay, pay close attention to detail, thanks. Very good. Anything hey, else in the state tournaments? Can I jump in for a second? I just want to publicly thank John C. Well, both Johns, but John Caracato too for for that switch. I'm just speaking on behalf of Air Academy and, and that change. And um, you know, everybody at Shine Mountain really jumped into to get that switch there towards the end with the restrictions at the academy. So um just speaking for a, a district school. Just want to say thank you to those guys for Chris Roberts too um, for jumping in and getting that done. You're welcome, and a lot of the a lot of the uh, effort also came from uh, Nate Erickson, the head pro over there. He we had blocked that date for a long time, and he had other activities, and I think he took a little bit of heat um, because he kept on holding on for that. So um, you know that that 
professional staff there has always been very accommodating towards high school golf and, and junior golf. So thank you very much, Andy. Hey, Andy, uh, Parks, I want you to just, uh, if you get a chance, just reach out to Blue Anderson at Air Academy. And I've already thanked him. And, uh, and the, the nice thing about uh, my conversations with him is that they, they are very much interested in hosting in the future. Uh, and it's just, uh, just an unfortunate uh, kind of situation with, with, with the base and the installation and, and all the regulations around uh, the Air Force Academy. But, but, uh, but Blue, un Blue understood and was really happy that we were able to make the change and, and just let him know we'll be, we'll be back at Eisenhower in the future. I'll do that, Tom. Awesome. All right, Ms. Barnhart, you want to give us an update, a JGAC update and all that business? Yeah, um, I, don't, I don't know that there is a big update. Um, I would just echo everyone's comments and, and thank everyone on this for making golf happen. It, it really was important, as Rhonda said, for kids to get out and to have something to do that wasn't online school. So um, thank you guys for letting them continue and, and play. And I, I just really appreciate our partnership. Um, if you've got suggestions on how to you know, streamline some of those things, those of you that were host schools, John might've just jumped off, but um, we're more than happy to kind of rework that, rework our role a little bit. Overall, I think it is getting to a place where it's pretty smooth. Um, there's mutual understanding of the, the roles and responsibilities. So hit me up with any ideas on that. Um, we're flexible there, but just super grateful to be partners. And um, this is a big deal for these kids. We hear them talk about all the time that they wanna be state champions and represent their school. And we have so much respect for that. So anything we can do to better serve you, your schools, your athletes, your parents, whatever that is, please just let us know. But other than that, we're looking forward to 2021. Our last JJAC tournament is the end of this month. So we're getting ready for the next year. Awesome. Hey, Ashley, so the dates of, so we start 426, regionals are June 7th and then state June 21, 22. Is that does that coincide with any big events that we can think of? I know we changed our calendar after we met last year as it was, so. Yeah, I mean, our, our kind of thought there is to continue to support um, the girls' championships the way that we have um, and the way that we're all familiar with. We'll still plan to run our typical summer schedule before that, um, that obviously both boys and girls are eligible for. My understanding is that the way the bylaws are written, kids would just need written approval if they wanted to participate in JGAC events or AJGA events, et cetera, um, we're not worried about it. I hope that these girls continue to choose to play for their schools. Um, I, I hope there's an opportunity for them to do both. There are some national events that week that are in state that your top players will want to participate in. Um, I personally don't see a reason why they can't do both, but that's up to you all. So um, we're going to, and we'll, we'll continue to run boys events during the, the girls state high school as well. So we're gonna keep it pretty status quo. We haven't scheduled any girls events over state high school because obviously that's a big deal for them, but that's kind of what we're up to. Um, a fairly normal schedule just with that on top of it. Hey, Ashley, when you get a chance, can you share those dates with Tom and I, just so when the girls bulletin comes out, we aren't, we're making sure regionals and other events aren't overlapping with those two, just to honor it. Cause I would agree it, you know, we are going into June with these events. So we want to be able to honor the work you guys are doing since you're trying to honor the work we're doing as well. So if we can get those big event dates shared out sooner than later, that will allow the ADs and coaches as they start reserving the courses um, for the spring. Um, they'll give them a bigger head start than the courses probably have right now. Yeah, I will get this to you. And we don't really start until uh, the Tuesday after Memorial Day, which I think is late this year. So that kind of crunch crunches things together a little bit too. But I will, I'll share our calendar with awesome. you, Chad. You, you have a big event, don't you, in June, I think? Is that a boys event? The one that, because we were trying to make sure that uh, we moved our regionals. Uh, our regionals are on, start on 6-6. And I think there was some major event the next week. Do you? Yeah, so the, the AJGA, which you'll, it'll take your top 
dozen or so local girls, they will really want to play in that. Um, it's really important to them. That is what my calendar, whatever week you just said, Tom is correct. I think it's six, six thirteen is a Monday. Yeah. And I think yeah, it's yeah. like the, it's in the middle of that week or something. Yeah. So, so it's basically, yeah, it's the week between regionals and state. Right. Um, so we've kind of planned around that. And then yeah. similarly, we won't, um, we won't expect to have full girls fields during your regional championships. Right, right, right. Uh, but yeah, Tom and I have looked at that. I'll shoot it over to you so everyone has it. I think that's actually great though to have that because that week between regionals and states sometimes as a former coach, you, you, you struggle to get the girls competition. So for those elite girls, it'll actually be nice to be able to send them off for a couple of days to compete. Um, right. And not just go through the same routine. Yeah, yeah, I just pulled that up. So your regionals are scheduled the week of the 7th. Then the week of the 14th is the, the big national event for your top girls, uh, which will be good preparation for them. They'll have a few days off and then state is that following Monday, Tuesday. So. Perfect. Awesome. Good stuff. Thanks, Ashley. Um, so I wanted to, I'll share kind of, I created an agenda just for today, just kind of what went well, what needs improvement, I think from this boys season. And anybody feel free to chime in at that point. But just having talked to coaches in the area, this is kind of what I came up with. Um, and that's just from this northern area. So if there's other things that I'm missing, by all means, um, let me know. And I can I can add those to the agenda for, for what we think needs a little bit of improvement. Let's see if I can figure this all out because i got 30 things going on now. And of course, I can't. Stop sharing. Sorry, I don't have to run classrooms that often, so this is new for me. So I appreciate people like you, Dave, on who are uh, doing these things. I have completely screwed up my computer now. Here we go. Chad, before you start, I, I do have to run at 11. Um, so hey, if I bounce you. off, that's why, but appreciate you all, and we'll hang on as long as I can here. Nope, I appreciate that. While he's doing that, Ashley uh, actually competed. At, you competed at, in high school as well, right? Yes. And uh, so it's good that uh, you kind of know that experience and what that means. That that's helpful. So yeah, I get it. Small town, North Dakota. It's very important to compete in all the sports and represent your school in that way. And I had very good and fortunate golf experiences and. We won some championships and took dead last in some championships. So I, I get it. <laughs> North Dakota. Thanks again, Ashley. I'm going to have to hold that against you as a Minnesotan, Ashley. I apologize for that. Oh, that's no good. <laughs> we'll meet you for the rest of the meeting and forget everything you've just said up to this <laughs> <laughs> So, So here's what I gathered worked well. Um, and again, coaches, chime in by all means. Um, so the students and programs, we adapted to the COVID-19 guidelines that Chassa um, kind of laid out for us really quickly and comfortably. And I think a large part of that had to do with JGAC and the work they did this summer with those kids to get them events. Um, there's obviously, and we'll get to there's the things that need improvement, but for the most case, people understood the concerns and were perfectly willing to make those adjustments to make sure their events happened. Um, and especially with golf starting off early, it was, it was good for them. So I, coaches seem to be pleased. Athletes seem to be pleased that they had that opportunity as well. Um, the movement of our top eight IWR teams, which we'll get to and how we can improve identifying those top eight teams, but the movement of them, I think was really received quite well, unless you had a team like I know up at, uh, Fort Morgan's when Mullen got slid into ours, people are, were not happy, but they also understand why they were slid in, um, into that place. So I think it's a good idea. And I think it gets our best teams in the state tournament. And then when you look at the state placement, um, they were pretty accurate for how state finished. And that's not to say the top IWR teams finished in the top place, but the top IWR teams were relatively close to, to the championship pairings up there as well. And so I think that was important that we, we got that pretty close to right. And there's always gonna be room for improvement, which Doyle talked about as well, identifying those top teams. But I think that went really well. And then going to the electronic scoring, um, for those that were part of the committee last year, it was supposed to be just a couple of leagues were gonna pilot it. And then obviously with COVID, um, the, the switch to everybody doing that was there weren't too many complaints about it. And, and that's a credit to Doyle because I remember as a coach, uh, eight years ago when IWR seven years ago when IWR got 
or I want to make her got introduced. Um, it was not received very well by us coaches. And I think that the gains it's made has been drastically, it, it's been impressive what the app and what the website are able to do for these golfers, these families, and our programs to make running an event actually easier than what it had been previously. So that's a credit to them. Is there anything I'm missing off of that group of what worked well in the fall of 2020 from coaches or ADs that you saw? I'm just knocking it out of the park here today, Tom. I know you. Sorry, sorry Chad. I, I got to go. Uh, just something to put in here is some, some of the coaches locally have talked about. If there's just a way we can maybe figure out how to um, maybe do it a little earlier for 5A um, with not knowing your regional. Um, it, it got a little late uh, for us. So in order to get kids a practice round, um, I don't know if we need, if, if setting a date would help um, or what, but um, like even for my school, it was, we had some, some tournaments get pushed back. And so it just became a little more difficult to figure out where we were going for regionals. So move up that waterfall regional date time that we give it to you guys just to give a little bit of, is that what you're saying, Andy? Yeah, just just so maybe it's a little bit earlier. Um, you yeah. know, maybe your league isn't finished all their tournaments, but maybe we still decide, you know, maybe it's 10 days before regionals or, or something, just so we can make sure there's practice rounds. You know, the good thing is golf's gone crazy this fall. Um, people are trying to get outside, but it became difficult to get um, tee times um, late yeah. uh, for regionals. So, Nope, I think, I think that's a good one to add on to there, so. So then I think things that need improvement that we heard uh, concerns, whether it was Tom, myself, or I'm sure other people on the committee heard concerns about um, balancing the number of regionals teams. At, um, if so, if teams were moved into a region or out of a region, was balancing those to, to make it um, more equitable number wise. Like I think we had 18 up in Fort Morgan, but then there was 15 in another one. And I explained it the same way Tom did that said, because of COVID, we're not gonna just start moving kids all over the state of Colorado unless it was one of those top eight teams right now. Just with this, I think we had to be cautious and careful in this fall season. I think we did a good job of that. But I think it's something, and again, I think it goes to Andy's point, if we do it a little bit sooner, it gives us time to rework some of those things and communicate that out. And I can't imagine, if we do it early enough, people probably won't have played too many practice rounds or tournaments at those uh, regional sites. But it's always gonna be tough not knowing who the top teams are, um, especially 4A, 5A as kids graduate and move on. But I think if we can balance those teams, I think it just it, it, it shows the coaches we're listening to them and, and we, we're taking their concerns seriously. Um, one thing I noticed was the organizing of events. Because of the COVID restrictions being so different from county to county and city to city, I think we need to make sure that they understand that regardless of the county that's hosting the event, the Chassa guidelines are still in play because um, I was at one event where there were no masks, there was awards being given out, there was a ceremony, there was no social distancing taking place. And I talked to the organizer of the event, I talked to the coach of the event, and their understanding was, well, this is our, our place, we can do what we want. And I, I actually left the event because as the committee chair and just as a human, I did not feel comfortable with what was happening at that event. But I think making sure we, especially for the spring season coming up, if we can get our girls coaches to organize who's on the range, who's on the putting green, who's on the, the chipping practice greens ahead of time, that information goes such a long ways to, to organizing and not having a problem. Because I don't know about you, but I'm pretty sure we're going to be dealing with COVID-related issues um, in this 2021 season coming up this April as well. So I think that's a big one for us is organizing those events. And it's easier to do it ahead of time than it is to do it and, and respond to right before the event happens. Yeah, I think that's on me. I think I just need to uh, may, maybe have some, maybe some of these Zooms we can have with, with, uh, with our coaches and the organizers a, a couple of times so, so we can get the, the word out instead of just having them have to, have to go to their bulletin and understand that that's what they have to do. And, and I, know, I, I would agree, Tom, you and I, if we want to host a couple of Zooms with golf coaches going into the spring, that's great. However, I'm pretty sure everybody understands the state mandates that are in place. And at some point, people have to be responsible adults and realize because, I mean, we had kids this right before the season started that were in state events or not state events, but regional events that um, 
they knowingly competed with COVID and didn't tell anybody about it um, before the high school season kicked on, not during the high school season. Mm-hmm. So it's one of those people know the expectations. I think at this point now we're nine months into this or how many ever months we're into this pandemic. So, but I think that wouldn't hurt Tom, you and I hosting a couple of these to just go over. Here's what it, here's what your event preparation sheet should look like. I think that's a great idea. Yeah. And, and that's some of the feedback I got with regionals. Uh, there was some, some, some hosts that were frustrated just with uh, uh, the fact that a lot of a lot of teams and players weren't prepared to to do the digital scoring and and yeah. and just all those things. So uh, so that that so there was a lack of communication. So we just need to we can do that, Chad. We can yep. we can get that word out. Wow. Um, and then the last one was I think one thing that needs is identifying the top teams in I want to make or Doyle. And I know you went through that a little bit is I don't know, because there's quite a few times where we send our A team to this event, our B team to this event. I don't know if there's a way to add a box that we can check on there that just says do not include this score towards our team IWR. Or if you just identify within all the IWRs that are posted, here are the events that we want to choose to be put into our team total. Um, But that was one thing coaches um, there wasn't a way to differentiate, and especially some of these bigger programs where they have quite a bit of talent, uh, they struggled with um, because we're trying to grow the program. Which I mean, Doyle's numbers showed we've grown we've grown golf in the state of Colorado immensely. But just to make sure that those top IWR scores were representative, because I know in our league, Silver Creek was technically the highest IWR team, even though Windsor had beat them in every um, competition we had, because Windsor had sent their number two team to other events multiple times. So it's just a finding a way to identify who that top team is and which scores we want to use. And Doyle, I don't know if you have an idea for how to do that or if what you were talking about earlier plays into that. Uh, and it does. So, so that th- this is this it plays in nicely, and that's why I wanted to show that because um, all you have to do is do what you're doing. Because if you like John, he just has to make sure his A team, his best team, plays and the number that you guys set. So if you guys set that number at five. As long as he plays his A team in five events, it doesn't really matter what happens beyond that because the qualifying round is only going to use the best. Okay. Okay. It's just that the way it's built is one team per school, right? And, and you know, it's, it's difficult to do rankings when you talk about schools. We're, we're ranking a school, right? And so then you start to get really complicated when you start, I don't know, an A team, B team, C team, E team. Well, which one's your varsity, right? So the best way to handle it, what other states do, is that – Set the minimum. When you hit that minimum, you know that your IWR is going to accurately gauge your AT. And then it's, it's good. Anything beyond that will get eliminated because, as you saw, in John's situation, I don't know how many rounds John had there, but we only took the best, the, the top six. And that's how the IWR for that team was calculated. So play your A team, B team, C team in, many vars- in as many varsity teams you want, and you'll end up with an accurate gauge, right, if you play your best team in at least that minimum number. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay, good. And that would, so from you, Doyle, that would be a state. We're going to set a number at this. They have to compete in this many events. Is that correct? Across, yeah, it'll be, it'll be that. That's why when I set, that's why I put that, you know, we need to set some standards, right? Across the whole state. So we can communicate that to everyone on how it works. Okay. Okay. And the other thing about that is that, uh, a question earlier about knowing what region you're going to, the data is all available. And if everything is communicated properly and we do the qualifying rounds and all Tom has to do is say, Hey, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the qualifying uh, of the qualifying rounds that IWR for that team. And we're going to place them in what region people will know that the, the, and what they do in Arizona is that this is the final day of competition on that day. At this time, you go look at the qualifying rounds rankings and you're going to know what everyone else knows. It's all public knowledge. Now, Tom, I don't know how you're going to make that decision, but the information is all there. It's all available. You know something, I, and I know that, and I, and I think we're getting closer and closer to using that, uh, that, that data that, that's in I want to make her. Uh, I, most of, it's, it's interesting, most of the 5A schools, which we do a pretty good water, waterfall by league, actually have their own kind of own database that they use to rank their league teams. And that could be done in I Wanamaker if they want. It could be done sooner. 
um, actually be done either way, but it's certainly, we certainly can use the data and I want to make her to do it as well. And that, and I, we probably just need to encourage them to do that. Uh, but I think like Andy says, we'll just, we'll just, we'll just up the, the date, we'll do 10 days and then get that information out and, and see how that goes, I think. Hey, David, Jess, and Kathy, what do you think is a reasonable number of events that would be a good minimum, maximum kind of baseline as coaches that would help identify who our top teams are? I was thinking about that, and they give us 11 rounds per kid, which I think is a great number and way too many. But I think more than half of that would be a fair number. So I'm thinking six to seven rounds only because that's a good database of a test of you're not going to keep your kids home just to save them rounds that way. You're going to make them play. And we signed up for this knowing that our kids are going to miss school, number one. And they're good athletes, most of them, and student athletes, and they understand that. So we're not setting them up for failure in the classroom, but we're also setting them up to want to compete and try to play at that next level. And we're not, I think that the more we rounds we do, the less we're trying to make this um, – wreck and more competitive, if that makes sense. I would say six is a good number too. I, I agree with six. Um, my main thing was I had a couple of JV players that last year their scores were figured into all this. So if this uh, is really going to work, I think that's why Jeffco does their own numbers is that they don't trust what's going on with I want to makers rankings. So they use their own. Um, can I throw out something that like thought in my brain too? Is there a way in I want to maker that we could specify JV players versus varsity players. And then the ranking was only taken on varsity players. Is that an option at all? I think that would take care of some of the issues as well. We considered that and that became very complicated. Now you're talking about moving. Well, he was a JV player this week. I moved him to varsity. Then I moved, that was just, that, that became very complicated. And so we ended up landing on one roster and identifying the event. This is a JV event. This is a varsity event. And now that we've got the rankings to throw out and to keep your best, it solves the problem, I think, of what you're saying. And, but, but yeah, there's complications with both. But having to manage two and three rosters is complicated as well, right? And now we've got to figure out a way to move kids from one to the other. And it just – we made this decision three or four years ago, and it's virtually impossible to go, uh, go back and say, oh, we should have done that instead and, and made the change. Is there a way just to use league scores rather than the invites and other things? So that would be, I could, I could potentially do that in the taxonomy of the system. I would, that, that's not what we do in other leagues, but I could consider that. Um, but there, now I've got to go in and say, well, what if you have one team that's outside of your league in there? And how am I going to know whether this is, yeah. you're going to start tagging events. By a lot of schools don't play a full league schedule, like have a league. So that would kind of be really hard for like, especially the smaller 3A schools in the East. Yeah, and for, for, for software, okay. that would not be easy to do. Okay. I wasn't aware of that. Yeah. Like I said, I, I think what we do too is when Tom and I, when we release kind of here's the teams that we have in the top eight w IWR, I mean, if there's, if, if there's not a necessarily a grievance, but if there's a concern about those two te those teams as well, that we can provide information on that that's reasonable um, versus, hey, we beat them one time and I think we should be ahead of them. I think that's stuff we can look at as well. I would say it's not necessarily a matter of trusting the IWR scores. I think they've, like I said, if you look at 5A and 4A, um, where the IWR is ended the season versus where they finished in the state and even individuals, like it is, it's a pretty dramatic, it, it's pretty spot on. And I, 3A is a little bit bigger window, but I think that also has to do with the fact that we've got 3A schools that are in the mountains and all those things. And I think there's a lot of different variables that 3A schools kind of have taken to place than 4A and 5A, but I would say for the most part, I was looking at it before this meeting. It's it's pretty impressive how close the state finishers by based on teams were, if you go back and look at their regular season rankings prior to their state finish. 
You know what else, Chad? I think that uh, Doyle can tell us like the average number of rounds that are played too might uh, give some insight as well. Um, and it's got just, that on there. It has the total number of rounds. Of, I mean, so like some schools, I think Valor had 14 or 15 rounds played, which we know isn't possible, but because they're listing varsity teams, like you said, that'll be the key is, Doyle, you're saying you just set the minimum, but you can't select the events you want to choose for the IWR score? Or can we choose it's the, the best. It, it, It's always the best. So, so when you play 10 rounds and you set that to six, we're going to throw out the worst four. And, and, and the reason we do that, it's teaching golf, right? Because when you get later in life and you decide to get a handicap, for example, we're taking your best 10 out of 20. Yeah. So it's teaching that same methodology, right? That, hey, yeah, it's just, and it's kind of logical too, that when you take the best out of how many you play, which also says, hey, we need to get, let's, you know, we got we to get rid of this one bad round. And Arizona's been doing this for seven years. It works really well, Right. They know they got to get out there and they got to play well because they want to kick out that that one bad score. Which hey, maybe it was windy, maybe it was rainy that day. It just you can work, you can you can you know play your team and and be able to eliminate that one bad round if you just get one more round in. So that's how that's how they'll be able to do it. I have a question for Doyle. Yeah. This is Dave Hunt from Bertha. Uh, does the IWR ranking take into consideration the course uh, ratings? Um, for instance, if kids are playing an easier course versus a more difficult course, even if it is three or four strokes difference, is IWR taking that into consideration? Yes, and that's the reason for the IWR. In moving away from average scores or, or scoring average, that's what that's what the IWR does. It, it 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 does exactly that. That's the whole reason for the IWR. It doesn't, uh, you know, the the U S the US handicapping or the world handicap system now is even taken into consideration, as the CGA people know, uh, wind and, and uh, you know, conditions on that day. Um, one day we may even have that, right, because of the, the great technology that's out there right now and knowing that, you know, hey, it was, it was 45 degrees out in the western slope on this day. And, and there's factors that they're actually taking into consideration when people submit their scores. Especially um, during so the girl season. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so <laughs> what we don't take into consideration is weather, right? And but, but uh, don't be surprised if that's not in the formula going forward. I got an email question so, from someone who um, kind of saying like, "What if someone's number one doesn't play in se till September?" And I think there's no way to account for that. In, in all honesty, I think if, if a team's player, whether it's through eligibility, you know, in this COVID season, through sickness and all those things, I think you can't. We can't take that into account unless all of a sudden this kid comes out and shoots. Now, again, I think that's the, hey, Tom, <laughs> hey, Chad, we're missing the boat on this team because this kid's played three rounds and look at the numbers he's thrown up. But I, I think specific examples like that, I think we – you deal with those on a case-by-case -case basis. But like I said, I think Doyle's team's done a good job of getting the IWR into a place where it is a good representation of that. I think setting the minimum number um, is where it's taking those top scores I think is great. Because again, it throws out those, I'm assuming your varsity two won't throw up better numbers than your varsity one team would. Um, and that allows for you to move kids between those teams, which we always do, um, especially depending on if you're playing five scoring four or some invites are four and three. I think it's gonna allow for, I think it's gonna allow for the best teams to get identified in that case versus, hey, we've got 15 events on our dock. Here's, here's our total score. Yeah. Because that'll yeah. allow the deeper programs to look like they're better they've got better scores than other places yeah the other thing we'll do is and we do this in arizona is we'll color so the visuals you know for a visual perspective it says hey what does red mean and there'll be information there red means you haven't met the minimum yet so if you guys set the minimum at six when you're at five it's great it's red when you get to six it's 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 you're good it's green right and then anything above that is green if you set a maximum, then it'll go red again, but it doesn't sound like you guys have a maximum. You, you set that on a pl per player round basis. So that that's taken care of there. So, but there'll be color indicators as well to tell people that you have not, your team has not met the minimum. And you want that too, because you want good data when setting the pairings for the regionals, correct? And, and how are you gonna get that? Everyone needs to, we need to have a good, accurate gauge of all the teams and players in the, across the state in order to use the IWR as a method for pairing when it comes to regions. 
So do you guys need a motion for this or for the number? Do we need to make a motion for that? We do. I would make a motion to set the IWR to six rounds per for the team ranking. Anybody have a second on that? Second by Dave Hahn. All members of the golf committee, uh, those in favor, I want to give a thumbs up into the old camera. <laughs> Anybody opposed? I just have a question. What happens when weather reduces the a number of tournaments you're available like in the spring with the girls and they only get four tournaments in? Or four rounds in. I think Kathy, you won't see that as much now with kind of how what legislative council passed last year with the extension of that, hopefully, and then obviously this season too with us not starting till April 26th. Um, I'm hoping the changes the golf committee made last year um, will eliminate that problem. Um, I think if it's a statewide problem, I think that's something that we would address then and reduce that number. Um, down tom correct yeah that's correct and and really what comes out of this committee is going to be for the 20 yep. uh 21 season with boys so um this won't be the case uh going into this to the spring but we it might be a test pilot to see what's going on in the spring with with girls and if they have more events you know so well so if, anyway, they play one, if they play once a week that's Counting regionals is six, right? If we start the 20, 20 That's six. correct. And then there's, yeah, the eighth week, the, the eighth week of competition uh, is uh, the, the next Monday, Tuesday is the state, state tournament. That's the way it generally works. And then I extend it sometime just to get off of uh, conflicts with uh, some of the Jewish holidays that seem to happen in that that time frame, so it might get it gets extended. But you're right; it's about eight weeks. Yeah. So no snow, I hope. <laughs> yeah, and I can change that, guys. Uh, Arizona did it. COVID. Uh, he's, he and it, it takes a, a second to change, right? So it's just a it's just a simple change of a number, and it's instantly available. It's all adjusted automatically. So so just know that 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 is very easy to change. So if you get in a snowy season, you said, hey, we got to make a quick change here. We're going to move it to four. I make the change and it's out there. Yeah, we can and we can do that. Chad, we could if that happened and we're really talking about the next season, uh, we could do that on the fly. If that if that we had just a bad season weather wise, we could look at how many what's what's the average number of rounds played and then make that adjustment. Yeah. Yeah. Does that make sense, Kathy? Um, where are we at here? Related to that, to, you know, I put up my the things that I need to set the season up each year. It, it's in the taxonomy of your season, and I can change that per season. Is uh, I put in the number of golfers, and I know that I get a lot of calls from coaches. You know, we do five four. Well, they're doing four three, and I have to explain to them. Well, we do four three because that's the way the state is, and so so. Um, each year, I just you guys tell me we're, we're our standard is still this, whatever that is, and then and then I put it in, and that's the way it's all done, and then we can communicate that with, that with everyone. It sounds good, Doyle, and maybe Tom, is that something we want to ask the 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 association if we want to stick with the four three? I think that's a bigger thing than us making that recommendation if we wanted to go to to five four or something like that. I think if, I, I, yeah, and I knew that that might be coming up because, you know, we're the only ones that are four yeah. score uh, three, three, yeah. So um, what it will affect is the number that go to state, right? Because we do threesomes yeah. and that's how we get uh, uh, 28, 28 T times. That's how we get the 84. So it's a pretty it's a pretty cool event, right? In terms of how you play, but there's probably a time that we might need to add a. I don't know what that number would look like if we had every if teams could bring five. 
right? And how we'd have to we'd have to spend some time looking at that piece. I, think. I mean, there, we, how many regions do we have? Right, we have, four. we have four regions in each one. So if each team that qualified, so you'd have an additional eight golfers essentially would come from each region. If we kept the individual qualifiers separate from the team qualifiers, we'd add eight golfers per state level, which would be. I mean, throw off the the if we the threesomes and stuff like that, but. I think it's something maybe you and I can talk about, Tom, and if we want to send out to the association and just see what they think. Okay. I think that I think that'd be a good uh, a good sur survey to put out. Yeah, and especially with like Doyle's numbers showing. I mean, our our numbers are skyrocketing in golf right now. Um, right, and it and it means more participation at state, and yeah. so it's it's probably. I knew it was coming. I just you know you you like. When I saw the slide too, I figured it was coming as well. That we're the <laughs> a head scratcher yeah. for me is when I started working with Minnesota, and I, I know the the demographics and the populations of Colorado and Minnesota are almost identical. And to to know that they have ten thousand kids participating, ten thousand right in Minnesota, it's um, I thought, what's going on here? What you know? Why 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 is the part and participation is growing in Colorado? No doubt, but it's not even close. To the to what Minnesota's doing, I don't know why. I can't answer that question. I just know that's the data. That, that's what's happening. I think also Minnesota's got a lot more golf courses that are readily available, yeah. especially yeah. municipal tracks, as opposed to what we have here. And, and they do nine hole rounds compared to, to eighteen here, so that's another one too. So, you know, uh, it, it, what we're talking about there for sure is going to be participation because I I think. With the format that we have, we're, we're crowning the, the right people, the right champions, the top 10, right? The top two teams, we just seem to, uh, we don't seem to miss on that, but but we would have more people going, more players going to state. Oh, I agree. Uh, the last thing I've got is just um, regional sites for the girls season are you to be determined. We'll, we'll get that information out soon. And then state sites, um, 5A, it looks like it's gonna be at City Park in Denver. And then Common Ground has offered to host um, either 3A or 4A um, state championships. And one of the two championships will be at Common Ground and we'll, we'll settle on the third location um, as soon as we can. So Tom, is there anything else you've got? I got one more question. So the double par pickup. So if you guys could tell me what you want set as a default or a standard, because that will be a, a feature available on the scoring for all the student athletes next year. What should that be? And that's just a I default. Would say, I would, is it an easy click of the button to remove the double par pickup? I can't remove it. Once it's there, it's there. It's going to be an option. It's not, you don't have to pick it. It's just an option. You just, it, it's, um, it's something that, that will be an option. They can still put their score in. They can put other in, but it's an option. I think if it's an option, I'm fine with it, but I know for, um, like league events up here, league events, regional and all that, that would be a do not score. Uh, their scorecard would be invalidated. But I think for invites and stuff like that, you're hosting or if you're going to do JV invites, I think it'd be a nice thing to have on there um, just for those kids to operate with. As long as it's not something that we, is going to be a necessity for every, every match. How do I get that on my scorecard? <laughs> It's going to be available <laughs> when you use the app going forward. You can... Hey, Andy, it's it's built in. <laughs> it's assumed. I I did have one other thing, maybe and maybe it's for your survey, Tom. Um, but some some coaches down here are are talking about they the waterfall for five A that they like it. Um, it was a little delayed as I shared, but is it something that long-term we want to look at for a 4A and 3A um, from a competitive standpoint? I think travel becomes a real, a bigger issue for 3A, um, but for 4A, I don't know that it's a, as big an issue. So um, not making a recommendation, just something to, uh, I think we can start to think about. So 4A waterfall, just like 5A? Yeah, right. probably, probably a good question. We could do that. And it it's, it it hangs uh, all on geography and travel and all all that stuff. Right. But I know the the eight teams that uh, uh, the top eight teams and we placed them where they they were. They all moved. So you know, I think it, I think we have a start on that. So yeah. so I'll put that in the survey. 
That'd be good. That'd be two, two good questions. Anything else? I mean, some other things that can be on that survey just to get some information. If you, if you have anything, just let me know. Sounds good. Anybody else have any information or for the good of the order? Greg with here. Um, Doyle, what's your phone number? I have some comments that really aren't relevant to, for the entire group. It is 719-659-2074. I'll give you a call a little bit. Okay, sounds good. Anybody else? Tom said he's going to deliver lunch to all of our uh, offices. Yeah, um, look, look for that piece of pizza coming through the door right now. <laughs> yeah, look, look Good luck that. finding mine. <laughs> we, have, we have a GPS tracker on you at all times, Andy. Don't worry. <laughs> My principal would like one. So um, with that, do we have uh, anybody have a motion to adjourn the golf committee meeting 2020? All right. Just made a uh, motion. Seconded from Andy Parks. All right, Tom, with that, we'll adjourn the golf committee meeting 2020 and then look for a survey at some point. Tom and I'll get together and can't thank you all enough for your time, your commitment to high school golf. Um, like I said, the, the numbers show that we've got a good group of people committed and supporting our student athletes and the golfers somehow just keep getting better and I keep getting worse and <laughs> bless their hearts for that. But thank you all very much for giving up some time on this day. Um, an hour and 30 minutes is a good time frame for that window. And Tom, thanks as always for your leadership. Appreciate you being willing to answer our phone calls, our emails as quickly as possible. Thanks, Chad. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Chad. thanks everybody.